right. I invite you to take your Bibles tonight in our study and open to the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 9, as we're studying Wednesday night, 1 and 2 Kings, learning what we can, lessons from the life of kings. And tonight I want to talk about a halftime warning. Look in the chapter 9 and look at verse 1. It says, It came to pass that when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon, uh, and, and, uh, excuse me, building the, the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. Did you know that in my early days of ministry, I was a football coach? That's right. Does that impress you? My nickname was Hurricane Harmon. That was a name given to me by a rival coach, and that name stuck in those days. Please don't use it now. But our church had a Christian school, and they had a football team, and I was on staff, and they asked me, it was kind of delegated to me to be the football coach. And, you know, as a coach, you have to come up with a game plan. You have to know who you're going to play and come up with a game plan on how to play against that team and how to uh, practice accordingly to that game plan. And one thing I learned early as coaching, and that was that we needed always in a game to make halftime adjustments. You know, you review everything that happened during the first half. Uh, you focus on the adjustments you need to make. That's especially important if you're losing the game. You want to make sure that you can make some changes to maybe come back and win the game. Um, you know, what are we doing wrong? What can we do right? But if you're winning at halftime, you want to really, as a coach, make sure that you keep the team from coasting in the second half. You want to keep them from becoming overconfident. You don't want them to take anything for granted. So as a coach, I would just give halftime warnings like the typical coach thing to do. I would say things like stay focused, you know, don't give up, stick to the game plan. You know, there's, this is no time to start co uh, coasting. You know, you haven't won the game yet and so on. Now, any football coach hates to lose, but the worst losses are when you're winning a game at halftime and then you end up losing the game. Those are the hardest losses to accept. When I read 1 Kings chapter 9, it sounds to me like a halftime warning to Solomon. I say that because this is the halfway point of Solomon's reign. Chapter 9 verse 1 tells us that he finished building the temple and he finished building the royal palace. He began this project in the fourth year of his reign. It took 20 years to complete both of these projects according to verse number 10 here in chapter 9. And so Solomon was therefore at the 24-year mark of a 40-year reign. And so far, he is winning the game big time. In the first half of the game, Solomon has made some really big plays. In fact, chapter 9 is really a review of some of the big plays you might want to say that he made. He completed the temple. He completed the palace complex. He established a spiritual center for the worship of God. He solidified and expanded the kingdom and his influence he achieved international status. He brought peace and prosperity to the nation. He led this nation to be focused on the Lord. We saw that in chapter 8 in that great prayer of dedication when he dedicated the temple. And so he's done a lot of great things. In fact, uh, it says in verse number 1 that basically Solomon had done all the things that he had desired to do. All the things that his heart desired to do, he was able to do those things. Uh, to use our football analogy, every play worked. Every play he called seemed to result in a big play. Uh, last year when I was watching one of the Ravens games, I remember one particular game when the Ravens played the L.A. Rams. And the Ravens, uh, this is the only time I've ever seen this in a football game with the Ravens. I mean, they were pretty much blowing the Rams out. In the first half of the game, every time they got the ball, they scored. I don't ever remember that ever happening before. Every time they got the ball, they were able to score. They were blowing the team out in the first half. This is what I could say about Solomon. Every time he got the ball here in the first half of his reign, it seemed like he scored. So now he's age 44. He's the golden boy who brought this nation into a golden age. And chapter 9 mentions some other things that he did. If you look in verse 26, kind of fast forward to the end, 
He built a navy with ships, able to venture down the east coast of Africa. He used those for trade. It says in verse 26, And King Solomon made a navy of ships, and uh, Ezion Geber, which is beside Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea and in the land of Edom. And so basically they sailed all the way to Ophar and brought back, according to verse 28, 16 tons of gold. He also did other major building projects. We look back in verse 15. He built the cities of Hazor and Megiddo and Gezer. By the way, archaeology has confirmed this, and I've had the privilege of visiting the ruins of these cities with other archaeologists. And you can see the design, the gates of these cities, that they all have this kind of Solomonic pattern of the way he would design a gate for a city. They all match. So these were all buildings, all cities that were built by Solomon. So again, just to say Solomon is winning big at halftime. But God, like a good coach, is about to give Solomon a halftime warning. Uh, You know, you might be winning the game right now in your Christian life. You might say, you know, so far in my Christian life, God has blessed me. Everything is going good. But you know what? You can still lose out if you're not careful. And so this is what God is going to warn Solomon about. And we need to take from this as Christians, we need to guard against resting on past successes and coasting in our spiritual walk. This is what God's going to warn Solomon about. God wants Solomon to finish strong. And by the way, that's the same thing that God wants for you and he wants for me. He wants us to finish strong. So what I want you to see in chapter 9 are four warnings that I draw from this appearance that God makes to Solomon. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, number one, Past successes are not a substitute for present obedience. Look at verse number 2. Uh, God appears to Solomon, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he appeared unto him at Gibeon. Verse 3, And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Here God makes another appearance to Solomon. And here the writer compares it to the very first appearance that God made to Solomon. If you've been with us in our study, you remember chapter 3 when Solomon was just became king. He goes to Gibeon. He, he gives a massive sacrifice to the Lord there. He lays all night before the altar, falls asleep, and God appears to him. And you remember that offer. God said, Solomon, what do you want that I would give to you? He kind of gives him that blank check offer. And Solomon says, God, I want wisdom. And God was pleased with that request. And God gave Solomon more wisdom than any man of his day. But now here the writer is saying God appears again. This is the second time. Actually, we know Solomon got a message in chapter 6. In the middle of that building project, God kind of gave a message to him to encourage him. But this is another big appearance from God to Solomon here, just like the first one. He comes at halftime, you could say halfway through his reign. And he tells him in verse number 3 that he heard the prayer, the dedication. Solomon, I heard your prayer when you dedicated the temple. I listened to it. I heard it. And you can always count on God resting his eyes on that temple, and his heart would compassionately respond to the people who prayed facing that temple. God assured Solomon that he accepted his prayer and this temple that he had built. In fact, the writer of 2 Chronicles indicates that following Solomon's prayer, the Lord sent fire from heaven to consume the sacrifices that were there. And then we also saw that the glory of the Lord filled the temple. These two events were a visual display of God's acceptance of this temple. But while God accepted the temple with these few brief words, he was more concerned about Solomon He was more concerned about Solomon's heart. This whole encounter was not about God accepting the temple. This whole encounter was about God warning Solomon in the halftime of his life. You see, God's always more concerned about us and the condition of our heart before him than he is about the things that we do for him. We have a tendency to look at the things that we do and brag on those, but God's not really concerned about that. He's concerned about your heart condition before him. And this is what concerns God about Solomon. Building the temple, that was great. But Solomon needed to realize that building a temple was no basis 
for his relationship to God. And the same is true for you. The things that you do for God is not really a basis for your relationship to God. We all have a tendency to think this way, to look at our past successes and our past achievements and kind of use them as a substitute for our obedience to God and an ongoing walk with God. It's almost like since we've done all of these great things in the past, there's no need for me to really walk with God or obey God in some of these things. We have a tendency to think, look at all that I've done. You know, I've put my time in. And you know what happens? Inevitably, people like, who think like that, they begin to drift in the second half of their, of their Christian life. Here's a man that got saved. He got on fire for God. He and his wife raised a Christian family. They served God faithfully in church. They were always there. They were always serving. They were always ready to help out. The, the kids grew up in a Christian home, and they eventually moved out on their own. And you know what? This man has done very well in the first half of his Christian life. But now in the second half, he's coasting. He's no longer faithful to church the way he was. He's no longer ready to get out and really help the way he used to. He thinks, you know, I put my time in. Let someone else do it. So he's no longer obedient to the Lord as he was before. Past successes are not a substitute for present obedience. So God gives Solomon a promise. Look in verse 4. And God says to him, And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart, and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. Notice the if-then construction. Solomon, if you do these things, then I will do this. If Solomon chooses to walk the right road, if he decides to walk with God like David his father, then what will happen? He will experience the blessings of God. You know, David set the spiritual standard for all kings who would follow after him. Not that he was perfect. When David sinned, he did repent. But he was the man after God's own heart, a man who's of spiritual integrity, who ruled in righteousness. And if Solomon chooses to follow in those footsteps, he'll be going down the right path. And so what God is doing is he's cha challenging Solomon to examine his own heart. Twenty years earlier, God said the same thing. If you will walk in my ways, if you obey my commandments, just like your father David, then I will bless you. Now, 20 years later, God appears to him again, and God says the same thing. And in essence, what God is saying, you can still lose this game in the second half. Don't drift. Don't coast. Here's the second principle. Future disobedience can undo past successes. Look at verse number 6. God continues. But if ye shall at all, at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. Now here God gives the solemn warning. And again, notice the if-then construction of these verses. If Solomon goes down the road of disobedience, then disastrous things will happen. Now, this warning has a gracious purpose. God wants Solomon to understand that the wages of sin are bad. But it's not just Solomon. It's also his children the royal sons of Israel. Notice that the language in the verse shifts from singular to plural in order to include not only the king, but also his children and his country. If the people choose the wrong road, they will suffer, and they will suffer bad consequences. They will lose everything that they hold dear. So we see then, if you turn from following me in verse 6, Verse 7, then I will cut off Israel out of the land. Verse 7, then this house which I have hallowed, I will cast out of my sight. 
And then he says, Israel will become a byword among all people. All that Solomon did will be undone. The temple will be destroyed. Instead of being a light and a glory to the rest of the nations, Israel will become a laughingstock. They will become laughable losers to the world. And people will treat Israel with reproach and with disrespect. And pagan mothers will say to their children, if you don't watch out, you'll end up like those Israelites. Remember what happened to them? Look at their, where their temple used to stand. Look at the pile of rubble that, it, that is there now. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, Israel will become an, an example of divine judgment. They will be a permanent object lesson of what happens to people when they turn away from God. And God goes on to foretell what they will lose again in verse 8. And at this house, which is high, the temple was built on a very high location. People could see it from all over. Everyone that passes by it shall be astonished and shall hiss, and they shall say, Why has the Lord done thus unto this land? into this house, and they shall answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon their gods, and have worshipped them, and have served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. This disaster that strikes will be God's judgment, but there will be no one to blame but Israel themselves. It will be their fault because they have forsaken the Lord. Remember, one of the reasons for the book of 1 Kings, remember, it was written to answer the question to the Jews that were in exile in Babylon, how did we get here? How did we get to this point that we're out of the land, that the temple is destroyed, that we're here in exile? How did all this happen? might be that you're asking the same question of your own life tonight. How did everything that was so good and the first part of my Christian life turned so bad. How did I get to this point in my life where I'm not experiencing the blessings of God? It feels like all the victories and the successes of my Christian life have been lost. It feels like the ground that I've been able to conquer in the name of Jesus has been recaptured by the enemy. That's because future disobedience can undo past successes. And this is what God is emphasizing to Solomon. But there's a third warning here. Number three, small compromises can have huge consequences. Small compromises can have huge consequences. Look down at verse number 10. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land, in, in the land of Galilee. Now what the writer is going to focus on here in this section is he's going to kind of weave in some small compromises that Solomon made during his reign. These small compromises had bad outcomes to it. And he's doing this for a reason. He's teaching us that in our own life, the decisions that we make, the small compromises, you know, the things that we do that we think, you know, it really won't hurt anything, those kind of things where we kind of compromise our integrity by small decisions. The writer wants us to see that those things will eat at us, and that ultimately they will take a toll. And the first area here is in Solomon's financial dealings and his international relationship with one of his good friends, Hiram, the king of Tyre, In verse 10, the writer summarizes the great building achievements, the temple and the palace complex, and then he immediately refers to Hiram. Why does he do that? Because the reason is clear. Without the kind and gracious help of the king of Tyre, Hiram, Solomon would have never been able to do what he he did. He could have never built the temple or the palace complex without Hiram's help. Because it says very clearly in verse 11 that he furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold according to all his desire. All the materials, all the supplies that Solomon needed, Hiram, the king of Tyre, just furnished it. Man, what a good friend that is to have. What a good relationship Solomon had with this king. Hiram had been a great help. He was a tremendous ally, 
Now, how does Solomon repay the kindness of Hiram? Well, the writer focuses on a business deal that Solomon made with him sometime later. Evidently, Solomon was strapped for cash uh, because of these two massive building projects. So he sold 20 towns in Galilee to King Hiram for 120 talents of gold. Now, Galilee is north of Jerusalem. Tyre is also north along the coast. So this would be closer to, to, Tyre, to Tyre's kingdom, excuse me, Hiram's kingdom of Tyre. And so it would, basically it would kind of increase Hiram's kingdom some to have the, this territory and these towns. This would kind of be like a Louisiana purchase type deal between Thomas Jefferson and Napoleon, you know. This is what Solomon was doing, selling this land for money. But notice what happened in verse 12. And Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they pleased him not. And he said, what cities are these which thou hast given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. So Tyre, excuse me, Hiram goes from Tyre out to Galilee to see these cities he was expecting them to be good. He was expecting the land to be good. He was expecting to be treated well by Solomon. After all, Hiram had treated him so graciously. And when he went out and looked at the territory he had purchased, he was really disappointed. And what he realized was that Solomon had ripped him off. So immediately he fires a letter. And in the letter, he expresses bewilderment. What have you done, my brother? He uses a, a, a gentle international term of brother. But very clearly, he was disappointed, and he calls the cities Kabul. Now, scholars debate over the meaning of this word. They say we really can't know this, what he means here for sure, but the word Kabul sounds like the Hebrew word for good for nothing or worthless. I think that's what he means here. Solomon, what you gave me was good for nothing. What you gave me was worthless, like ordering something online, you look at it in the picture, it looks pretty good. When you get it, you're pretty disappointed. It's worthless. That ever happened to you? There are certain places you never want to order from. See me after church. Worthless. And what Solomon did was he cheated a good friend. Seemingly, he got away with it. He turned a huge profit on a relatively worthless piece of land, but in doing so, he compromised his own integrity by doing that. That small compromise told a lot about Solomon. Ironically, later it was Solomon who would write in Proverbs 20, 23, unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord. Unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord. To take advantage of someone, giving them something uh, really that wasn't worth the price that they paid for it to God, that's an abomination. And Solomon compromises his integrity here some. But also we see it a little bit further. There's another thing that the writer refers to. Now from verses 15 down to verse 19, these verses talk about the other building projects that Solomon was engaged in, the cities that I mentioned before. But look at verse number 20. How did he accomplish these things? And all, all the people that were left of the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which were not of the children of Israel... Their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able to utterly destroy, upon those did Solomon levy a tribute of bond service unto this day. So what is the writer here pointing out? Well, part of the way that Solomon was able to accomplish some of his building ambitions was to use the Canaanites that were still there in the land. He made them do the heavy lifting, the heavy work, so to speak, rather than drive them out of the land to continue to or to not associate with them like God commanded in the very beginning when Israel got into the land, Solomon just uses them for his own purpose. Now, by the way, this is the, this is the same mistake that the Israelites made hundreds of years earlier when instead of driving them out of the promised land like God commanded in the book of Joshua, what did they do? They, instead, they made them do labor. It was easier to use them for their own purpose than to utterly drive them out. But God had warned Israel 
that if you do that, they will be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off the good land which the Lord your God has given you. God said if you keep them in the land and you work with them, eventually they will become a snare to you and you'll eventually lose this land. And that's exactly what happened. You see, the reason for all the idolatry in the high places is because the Canaanites were doing that. They were still worshiping their idols and their false gods. And they were influencing other Israelites to do the same thing. Solomon, rather than dealing with this and getting rid of them, he chose to put them to work. He he chose to use them. Peterson wrote this, Motivated by a materialistic attitude, they, that is Israel, chose to put the Canaanites under tribute, exacting payments from them on an annual basis in order to gain additional wealth That proved to be a fatal mistake for in later centuries, uh, they they came to rise up and enslave Israel. This is another compromise that Solomon made, that he thought, oh, it's not going to hurt. And the Canaanites, we could could really say that the Canaanites can represent to us things in our life that God does not want us compromising with, little pet sins, little habitual things that are destructive little compromises that we make and the decisions that we, we uh, make every day. These are things that can hurt us. And so here's this compromise that the writer, again, points out. But let, let me give you the fourth warning here. Outward religious deeds are no substitute for inward devotion. Outward religious deeds are no substitute for inward devotion. Devotion. Now, go down to verse number 25, where it says, And three times in a year did Solomon offer burnt offerings and peace offerings upon the altar, which he built unto the Lord. And he burnt incense upon the altar that was before the Lord. So he finished the house. This is an interesting verse because it mentions Solomon's ritual of going three times a year to the temple to offer sacrifices. But what's interesting is the last phrase of verse number 25. The King James Version reads, so he finished the house. You may have a different English version that might read a little different, differently. That's because for a lot of scholars, the Hebrew here is very difficult to translate. So some translate it like this. So he fulfilled the temple obligations. Or another one says, so, so he did his religious duties. I think that's more of the idea of what the writer is talking about here. In other words, it kind of comes across cynical. From the writer's perspective, Solomon's heart was not completely devoted to the Lord, obviously not because of these compromises that he was making. However, outwardly, he was doing the religious duties. Three times a year, he would go to the temple. These were the three major feasts where you're supposed to go, Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. He would always be there for those three feasts, He would give the sacrifice that he was supposed to do. He was doing all the things outwardly that he should do as a king, but inwardly his heart was not where it needed to be before God. And the reason we know this is because look look right before verse 25, but Pharaoh's daughter came up of of the city of David under her house, which Solomon had built for her. Then did he build Milo. In other words, the writer here focuses on again Solomon's marriage to the Egyptian princess, which was strictly a political move because he wanted to have trade with Egypt, getting horses and other luxuries. But this was contrary to God's will. God was always warning about depending upon Egypt or making alliances with Egypt. Again, that was another little compromise that he points out there. And all these things add up to show that although outwardly Solomon was doing the right things, inwardly, his heart was not where it should be. You know, if you're not careful, you can go through the motions of religious duties and not have your heart right with God, not be right on the inside, not be where you're supposed to be. You know, when we're most vulnerable after we've had spiritual victories and successes to allow our heart to drift away from God. And outwardly, we're still going through the motions. We're still doing all the right things, but inwardly, our heart is just not there. And you know it, and God knows it. Everyone else might not know it, 
Because outwardly you look fine, but inwardly your heart is not where God wants it to be. And it's kind of like the rebuke that Jesus gave the church at Ephesus where, you know, the church at Ephesus was doing all the right things. But what was their problem? They had left their first love. Their heart was not where it needed to be. Also, the rebuke that Jesus gave to the church at Laodicea. Remember, that was a church that said, you know, we're good, we're rich, we're increased with goods, we have need of nothing. Can you imagine a church saying that to Jesus? You know, Lord, we really don't need anything. We're fine just the way we are. But Jesus' response to them was, you do not know that you're wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. And because you are lukewarm, I will what? I'll spit you out of my mouth. I can't use you. God has no use for lukewarm Christians. Do you know what G. Campbell Morgan said about lukewarm Christians? He said, it's the worst form of blasphemy. It is worse than not even believing God. Why? Because he says, lukewarmness says, God, I believe in you, but you just don't inspire me. You just don't excite me. That was the very thing that was going on in Solomon's heart. Because later on, we're going to find that he begins to worship or burn incense to other gods. What a terrible thing. So what we could say was that the very things that God warned Solomon about, he ended up doing. And the first half of the game, man, he scored on every play. But he ended up losing in the second half. For all practical purposes, he ended up losing. He sowed the seeds of destruction for the entire nation of Israel because they all followed in his example. And really, chapter 9 answers the question, ask in verse number 8, why has the Lord done this unto the land and unto the people? Why did all this happen? It was because the people disobeyed the Lord. Past successes are not a substitute for present obedience. Future disobedience can undo past successes. Small compromises can have huge consequences. Outward religious deeds are no substitute for inner devotion. You know what we need to do? We may need to make a commitment as Christians to finish strong in the second half of our, of our Christian life, to not coast, to not go through the motions, to make sure that our heart is where it needs to be. Steve Farrar in his book, Finish Strong, tells about three young evangelists He says in his book, 1945 was an absolute great year for young evangelists. He said, in that year, there were three young evangelists that were packing out stadiums. Billy Graham was 27. He was noted as a gifted speaker for Youth for Christ. But there was also a man named Chuck Templeton and Bron Clifford. You've probably never heard of them, he writes. But Templeton preached one evening to an auditorium of thousands. He was called the most gifted and talented young man in America today for preaching. And in 1946, there was an article about the men who were the best Jews of God. And the article highlighted Chuck Templeton. It never mentioned Billy Graham. It called Templeton the Babe Ruth of evangelism. Bron Clifford was another 25-year-old fireball. He believed, or excuse me, many believe that Clifford was the most gifted and powerful preacher the church had seen in centuries. That same year, Clifford preached to an auditorium of thousands in Miami, Florida. People lined up 10 to 12 deep outside the auditorium to get in. Clifford preached at Baylor University that same year. He preached for two hours and 15 minutes. The university ordered the school to to turn off the class bells to let him go on and preach. He had the students spellbound on the edge of their seats. Three evangelists, Graham, Templeton, and Clifford. All three were shooting stars, an article says. Yet, you've heard of Billy Graham, I'm sure, but you've probably never heard of Chuck Templeton or Bron Clifford. Why is that? Well, because just five years later, Templeton, he left the ministry to pursue a career as a radio and television communicator and as a newspaper columnist Templeton decided he was no longer a believer in Christ. By 1950, the future Babe Ruth of evangelism wasn't even in the game. 
he no longer believed any of the claims of Christ. What about Clifford? By 1945, excuse me, 1954, Clifford lost his family, his ministry, his health, and then his life. Alcohol and financial irresponsibility had done him in. He ended up leaving his wife and their two, ch- their two children. And at age 35, this once great preacher died of cirrhosis of the liver in a rundown motel on the edge of Amarillo, Texas. His last job was selling used cars in the panhandle of Texas, he died unwept, unhonored, and unsung as for our rights. So in the Christian life, it's really not how you start that matters as much as how you finish, that you finish strong in the second half. So the question is, how do you want to play this game in the second half? How do you want to finish God wants you to finish strong. Let's bow for prayer together tonight. So as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I would just ask you to examine your own heart in light of what you heard tonight. How is your walk with the Lord? How is your relationship with God? Are you just simply going through the motions? You say, you know, I've had a pretty good first half. I I deserve a little time to do what I want. Well, friend, if what you want is not what God wants, I, I wonder where you are. You feel like that you need a break from obeying or walking with the Lord. There's a problem there. Those who are truly the Lord's play strong in the second half. They're not going to want to quit. They're not going to want to coast. They're going to want to increase in obedience, increase in holiness, increase in their love for the Lord. So where are you tonight? Where's your heart in this? And how many be willing just to pray right where you are? You don't need to raise your hand or anything, but would you just tell God, God, don't let me fail. Don't let me fall away. I don't want to coast in my Christian life. I want, to, I want to finish strong. Help me, God. There's so many challenges out there. Challenges for your affection that would draw you away from God. Make a determination that I'm going to finish strong by the grace of God. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts tonight. Use them to inspire us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.